Good evening. Can everyone hear me? All right. I know Simone White has a slightly complicated relationship to the word freedom. But in her body of work, there exists a freedom that resists cliched notions of emancipation and is the opposite of Lauren Berlant's cruel optimism. This freedom exists as a willing engagement in that which is both pleasurable and messy. Whether that pleasure and messiness finds itself in the complicated labor of black single parent mothering or in acts of poetic creation within the regime of craft, and to that point, White has described metaphor as, quote, a form of patriarchal control over language and a currency of poetic power, end quote. This freedom exists in White's repulsion and draw to capitalism as she confesses, quote, I think in units of $1,000, end quote. And this freedom exists in the pleasure and messiness that comes with writing female desire in a culture that created and continues to recreate the Scarlet Letter. When Simone White last fall virtually visited my contemporary feminist poetics class, a student asked a question that is always asked of writers. Who is your audience? And White responded to the query with, you don't ask a sculptor, who is your audience? No, we don't ask a sculptor who is his audience, but we definitely are White's audience. White's work implores us to rethink, to reconsider our fealty to notions of existing that lack critique. And if we could personify her body of work, it might proclaim in the words of Wale and Rick Ross, I'm heavy, where are you at? So tell me why you're mad, y'all can't keep up. Poet and literary critic Simone White is the author of Or On Being the Other Woman, Dear Angel of Death, Of Being Dispersed, House of Envy of All the World, the chapbook Unrest, and with Kim Thomas, the collaborative poem painting chapbook Dolly. A graduate of Wesleyan University, she holds a JD from Harvard Law School, an MFA from the New School, and a PhD in English from the City University of New York Graduate Center. Her honors include a 2021 Creative Capital Award, a 2017 Whiting Award in Poetry, and Cave Canem Foundation Fellowships. White's poetry and prose have been published in Art Forum, Harper's Magazine, Bomb, the New York Times Book Review, and the Poetry Foundation. White is the Stephen M. Gorn Family Assistant Professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania and lives in Brooklyn. Let's give a hearty Wash U St. Louis welcome to Simone White. smaller than everyone. Thank you so much, um, Professor Hurd, for having me here. Thank you, Meredith and Meredith, for having me here. Um, it's really nice to be in St. Louis. I like it here a lot, and um, it's a good time of the year to be here, too. Um, today, I, I, my plan is to give some remarks in a way that I don't usually do that, that is, I've written them down, and I'm going to sort of give um, a, a kind of preliminary talk about the, the more recent poems that I've been writing, um, which mostly actually have to do with works of visual art or have been engaged with them in some way or commissioned by those, that's the word they use, not me, commissioned by those who are involved with institutional uh, art institutions for one reason or another. Um, and so I'm just going to start talking and then 
the reading itself, I'm not sure how much time I'll have to read the poems because they're almost, each one is quite long. So we'll see how much time we have to, except one, which has a lot of curse words in it. But I'm going to, I think you'll like that one best. Okay. So. I don't even have a title or anything. I'm just going to talk. My recent poems reflect reconsideration of my own poetics in a broader context of art making, poesis, including the relation of my writing to the field of visual art. I mean, my actual desire to better understand enactments of blackness, especially as sound, and thus to extend my practice into performance was not the only reason I started to become more interested in visual art, and especially black performance art, so-called. As I came to the public's awareness as a poet and critic, a species of art professional, I also became aware of a representation of myself from which I felt entirely alienated. I was to be a spectacle witness, and also a spectacle hyphen witness and also an arbiter of precisely the ideology of representation that my intellectual development and writing practice attempt to evade. I'm describing a complex personal sense of my place as an artist in a social and institutional context that I can't really fully get into this evening, but I can bring our attention to three points in particular. First, there's the idea of forcible performance, which I've tried to elaborate in a couple of talks and elsewhere, which is meant to point to the development of the relation between writing, performance, and the art world that I've argued constitutes a serious and potentially problematic force in contemporary poetry, insofar as poetry's radical potential as thought and art is, let's say, re-territorialized by complex market forces in the art world. And some of the sort of core ideas for the idea of forcible performance come from this Ito Steril lecture in 2015 called The Terror of Total Dasein, which some of you might be familiar with, which kind of describes the growth of performance as a branch of art practice and the museum's demand for it. I am, of course, arguing that there isn't much money in poetry. And with a true handful of exceptions that prove the rule, you can't get famous doing it. That is, its littleness in terms of economic consequence can and does still allow for a kind of independence from the art world and academic economies that can distort art practice and imagination. The demand for forcible performance is particularly troubling when we consider its racial dimension. The institutional demand for performance is also a demand to participate in the existing racial order, to appear as black for the purpose of telegraphing the institution's sympathy for the excluded black and or its inclusion of the excluded black. This is, of course, a circular relation, useless at best, dangerously close to minstrelsy at worst for the serious black artist. The poet Doug Carney does a lot of amazing work around this idea. The related issue of the demand for poetic response to art, which kind of gets us to where the work is tonight, often objects of a specifically visual kind, um, is part of the apparatus of the catalog or audience-directed programming external to the artworks, and is posed as an alternative to exegetical writing and thinking of an art historical nature and is also deployed as content that is enfolded, enfolded by the object context. I'm going to read that again because it's like a little thorny. Um, I don't usually repeat sentences, but here we go. <laughs> this kind of written response, part of the apparatus of the catalog or audience-directed programming external to the artworks, is posed as an alternative to exegetical writing and thinking of an art historical nature. That is a kind of art writing that is not art historical, but is nonetheless demanded for explanatory purposes and also for a kind of art purpose, right? You don't 
want the audience to feel oppressed by its art historical ignorance. He wanted to be included by a kind of broad art sensitivity, which the poetic response is supposed to bring forth. Yeah. Thus, the demand and market for such a response is a solution to specific ideological problems of contemporary art. The unintelligibility of poetry and the inarticulacy of the art object are yoked together in the form of ekphrasis, which assures the listener, reader, viewer, that both arts are safely anchored in the realm of representation. The third thing, because I believe that poetry makes it possible to think impossible thoughts, thoughts that are off the epistemological grid, I believe poetic thinking must seek a horizon of possible language and become writing that is always in a relation of negation with the demand for legibility. I do not work for the museum, the university, or the artist who pays me. I refuse this labor, which is not my work. How is illegibility, that which cannot be read, related to abstraction, what cannot be correlated to things seen? Legibility is proposed, assumed, and embedded within the act of writing. When I, a black woman, move to write about art, I negotiate a given temporal horizon of legibility and visibility, how these are processed at this time through the expression of my difference as blackness and sexuality before the first word comes out. How can I set or situate myself to work and near the practice of others as I try to say something that is not already there? I prefer to consider this attempt in terms of materiality, a term that encompasses abstraction insofar as that which is real has not necessarily been or become symbolically represented. The resulting works are sometimes abstract and often emerge from fiddling around with the philosophical notion of concepts, which is not exactly the same as the art historical notion of concepts. Every portrait is of Picasso. Black, doubling, winged, figment, not a figment, angelic course, drawn or spat upon uncooperation, maybe a very old curse, without believing in an occult of any kind, spittle or marks, having the quality of paper, film, besides transparency or rotting leaves, holes, and filaments. I'm given to understand I am to work from the black double. Within her, formally, I am to reconstruct her melodramatic hinge. Offended though I am by this terrible joke vagina, I'm gingerly to ask questions of this tissue, this ink blot. Fine, I'll do it. As if the commissioners will wait. This morning, under the BQE, my son said slavery was s slavery was st slavery was in fact stupid, and stupid isn't profanity. His winsome genius modeling reconstruction for his stupid mother, dully rotating this ink blot in her black and white undertow, dichromatisms a heavyweight to carry. Are we not rather before it? its weight metaphorical in the way that is the opposite of illumination. This thing proves to be very quiet. I keep saying to it, what? Did I forget to mention that she moved? A fact introducing many problems. A gap is not a hinge, an open space introducing troubling magical conclusions. I would not say I was obsessed with mirrors. 
But then the closer my thinking comes to recognizable pictures, the more abjectly nonverbal the life situation or durational experiment is likely to get. This creaturely smear of barely black against a strong white background. Uh, uh, <laughs> don't be mad. Oh my God, I'm so tired. Completely stunned by the weird rhythmic implications of John Berger's writing or T.J. Clark's, they are both the same. Let me, no seriously, let me. I put two passages side by side, one from Farewell to an Idea, the other from the Picasso book. Inside, both of which I was led to lurch around in an ugly way, this whole situation might be called discrepancy between description and experience, although I have to admit being unsure whether what I mean here is not actually representation. The betweenness of these three as the space of art, also a wordless battery. The whole situation, Kafka-esque, not only imaged as such at the level of the anatomical protuberance, at least additionally the level of the required reading. Her lack of limbs indicate subjunctive demand to be released from the evolutionary or vestigial. I never bought any of that Fanon jive about how the white freak out when they see the nigger. I felt curious about the claim. White folks spit on my mother, etc. But I was born in 1972. Roe followed soon thereafter, my birth year and the year of the court's pivotal recognition of certain liberty or freedom interests, oft confused. With Berger, though, Picasso has now, in fact, transcended the need for money. I was really taken aback. I am not totally ignorant, yet the professional tone of Berger is not intelligible to me. The sensation of having to pass one another by intellectual chance, unable to pause over the possibility of tutelage here is a memory of myself as a very young woman, having caught for an instant the gaze of Duncan Kennedy, whom I credit for noticing my ineptitude with legal materials and skepticism regarding my incompetence. I pass them. They do not teach me, but come to hand through the elite matrices of reading with which I maintain relations. At the same time, intimate and highly tangential. I tell my lover, Harvard trained with all the grating bad habits of practitioners of learned small talk, all I have of this work is a promising title, but he is on his way back to his wife. Thus, it cannot be said that he was even addressing me. The berger falls out of his mouth, then he is gone, and after I order the book on my phone. I could be wrong about the qualitative difference between the scholarship I ascribe to my peers and my severely fractured attention. Researches depend now upon who I happen to be fucking or taking care of, bringing me randomly here and there, pressure on me attention so intense it has become a matter of the body, probably the neurological basis of breakdown, I note casually. Nonetheless, powerfully excited by the difference between our thinking and writing, Berger's and mine, that can't be figured at all, one of tone, difference having to do with differential weight, weight of life. Decoding, she must indicate, indication, eruption, or so to speak, compulsion, to center myself, a blank gape, my asphodel, anti-flowering, with a propensity for shame. Additionally, I am interested in William's prostrate entanglement, this mania. Anyway, I was shocked to discover the convergence of my broken intuition with the flaccid affect of Berger in the Picasso book. Perhaps it would be better to say our conversational similarities were disheartening, to say the least, painful. There is no such thing as attention in my worldview. I take the word seriously when it is used by Meme Bersenbrugger.
whose techniques for having the poem hold time are a major contemporary example. For two years, I have wanted to say something about the way her treatise on stars realizes, then destroys every statement as a possible standalone. Particles flash in and out of being. The border between life and death may not continue in other dimensions. Gravity and time flex. Her thought does not believe in itself, which may be the source of the inescapable energy born through her lines to pray, to read. Our attention that collapses quanta contains a kind of meaning intrinsic to feeling connected. I read a few pages, then put her work down because it is heavy. Bersenbrugge recognizes the need to use words to describe what was never there is the opposite of sport. There's no muscularity in her writing's exquisite mass. I stop myself from addressing Meme as mother when we can be together, although there is reason for calling her this way, as some call Sonia Sanchez. My mother calls from Los Angeles where it is still morning. I am writing on New Year's Day, afternoon, year three of the pandemic. When she learns I am alone for a few hours, she says goodbye, don't answer the phone again. The mother holding all disrespected consciousness, knows you have never enjoyed what others call play. She prays, little cards with glitter inside, cast time in beams of light from the desert or mesa. Berger repeatedly calls Picasso a vertical invader, not his term. Let us call his biographical investigation a portrait assuming what took place between them was interpretation. This was before FaceTime, by the way. I do not believe any totem could be erected in a space where such an exchange might be given. That divide is beyond that which marks connect. Of necessity, I cast my eye down on the scaffold, rack, guillotine. You catch my drift. But now I've set up a sense of spatial habitation I don't intend, though these few words come through as rightful, rightfully conveying disquiet with brutality that is component of or is the very idea that history breaks through the bodies upon which it exhausts its evil. Like I'm up here and the revolutionaries are climbing the barricades, climbing the barricades down somewhere else. I don't see things like that at all. I said I was talking about Berger's tone, and now I have to get out my thousand plateaus. I see rhythm advanced itself in the earliest stages of the revolting impression. I think I'm missing the last page of this poem. Oh, sorry. That's actually been the poem. <laughs> Sorry, I'm always forgetting what I said at the beginning. There's a David Milch monologue regarding apology in times of plague to which my kind of sorry belongs, the pussy kind of sorry. Sorry, I apologize. Can you be happy now? It is the difference that is rhythmic, not the repetition, which nevertheless produces it, say D and G. What is rhythmic will express the relation of the territory to interior impulses or exterior circumstances, whether or not they are given. When I had felt the not given impulses and circumstances where our variations had crossed, that is the space within which the figure in question had emerged, unspectacularly down with children's germs, the opportunism of viruses having renewed prominence or forwardness among the middle-aged in the population, weakened and cowed, isolated and exhausted. I saw myself in the mirror, grown thin and at the same time swollen, dried up, and brought myself back to the spirit of exchange or investigation between parts of the same spirit, why I am unwilling to attack my sister, for example. Look, look, she said, look at me. Berger concerns himself with what Picasso offers for consideration, claiming it is himself, the 
but also that Picasso is worthy of his name, which is not a name, but a means of escaping the world. This I did not forget, only insofar as himself is another, another woman. Oh no, says a dried up person on the other side of my eye, the interminable and violent pounding one must give the shadow self, she who would be the object, I understand and condemn. Run away, dear. So that poem was constructed only because Adam Pendleton asked me to write something for a catalog. And the work itself, I did, approaching the work in the way that I had been asked to approach the work in an essay, a catalog essay, just it wasn't working for me. And so I needed to find both a way that would advance the work that I was already doing, thinking about why I kept being asked to write catalog essays, for example, <laughs> and also what my actual relationship to the work might have been. So that, that is that poem, which is called Every Portrait is of Picasso. Um, I hadn't planned on like chatting between works, but I'm going to do that just for one second to explain that I'm going to read next a kind of adjunct to that poem. I had been thinking about that Berger book for a long time, and I had also been thinking about um, another <laughs> book, <laughs> the T.J. Clark's book on, on modernism. And I was asked at that point by the Met and also Kavi Kanem, God bless them, to write uh, a poem in response to a work in the Met's permanent collection. This was for Juneteenth, of course. So they said, Simone, go to the museum, find a work of art, and write about the work of art. And you know, it will be an, what do you call it? An ekphrastic, yeah. So I did it. This poem is called, <laughs> It's even a joke that I'm saying this poem is called. I would never say that. OK. Washington Crossing the Delaware, number 28, June 6, 2022. There was to be an art historical joke about Washington's balls in this space, for I am a lover of tawdry jokes and poop humor. There is, in fact, a bejeweled or engorged set of cherries peeking out from beneath the war costume of the general crossing the Delaware, resting so as to catch the eye, to humiliate, and also to allow for plausible deniability. But Isaac cried out when I explained the grammar of certain common curses, and we busted a gut, laughing almost till we cried, because how could it be that ass means butt, and shit is actually poop, and this is exclamatory. But and fuck are not the same. It's a wild painting. I am a patriot, as everyone knows. The sublimity of the country still lives with me. I do not struggle with my Americanness. Whatever I am is one with the general and the double prick Lutz gave the man in the picture. Better to fuck you with, my dear, if you must know how I speak to myself. Pretending this is a world in which there could be a symbolic, I find the rosy fob foreboding and terrible, fucked coming and going over the river. Crazy, it's not even this painting that interests me, but the relay between it and the abex conversation T.J. Clark is having with all of Western thought. How do you start a conversation like that, you might ask? And the punchline is, by quoting Hegel, but only after Frank O'Hara. I'm twitchy around abex. It excites me in a bad way. I feel ill will toward number 28, but I'm ignorant and can't really follow the guy's moves. Clark's I can follow, though. You feel me. I declare, je suis l'une d'elle. Je déclare avoir avorté. And also, I can't stand the domineering tone of this form of art criticism. I thought I was going to jail yesterday at the Park Slope Food Co-op because that's the kind of bourgeois I am the kind who gets arrested at the supermarket for being uncivil to white people. I am uncivil. Jace tells me so all the time. Trouble died today. The dead are piling up around us. 
the gallows lift on the river of gore. Of course, the museum said they cannot print such a thing. Um, I'm going to read this most very recent poem. And if I have time, then I'll read this other poem called The Clothespin. Should I read The Clothespin? You want to read The Clothespin? OK. I'll read the clothespin. <laughs> this is another really slow poem, but I will read the clothespin because it's relevant. OK. So this is the clothespin for Joan Retallick. And it has a little epigraph um, from Lewis Kahn. A city should be a place where a little boy walking through its streets can sense what he would someday like to be. I don't have a picture of the clothespin. Do you know the clothespin, the Klaus Aldenberg sculpture? which is on the corner of 15th and Market Street in Philadelphia. I, it must be 40 feet tall, and it's just a clothespin. <laughs> I don't know what to say about it. Um, but it was, it, I, it was, I'll say a little bit about what it has meant in my life. The golden glow characteristic of Philadelphia's morning light is best viewed from the southwest corner of Market Street facing east facing the Delaware, natural boundary of the colonial city. Ben Franklin, of course, alights from that body in legend, first of his kind on legs, to originate the history of boys, apart from the history of light. None of the significant historical scenes that shaped the landscape of ideas in Philadelphia's power structure in the 1980s or any given time would have anticipated the life of the black teenage girl running the low-slung stairs leading to the concrete plinth that supports Klaus Oldenburg's clothespin. Ed Bacon's keynote downtown project does not contemplate six-year-old black girls who use the buses and trains alone, fear hissing her yellow carpenter pants as she lifts the gate latch outside a Mount Airy River stone. Seconds before she can use the brass key, she is clutching in her little fist. 16, she can run. Though no one credits her athletic or physically creative in any way, two miles in under 13 minutes, a clip that assures a decent chance of a getaway from your lunging crackhead or rapist. She navigates the dank crap subway to nowhere hose strolls and black commercial avenues, north, south, northwest of her location. In the heart of Philadelphia, black children get bombed, so knowing how it's built is good. Not sensing what she would like to be, who is before you sprinting the stairs, emerging from the commuter rail concourse, she runs the tunnels past luminescent below grade tulips, shoe shine, septa tokens, Dietz and Watson, hot sausages, the place's urine pools, abandoned, unplanned, violent, manifesting a process most people did not realize was going on, power most did not know even existed. Her father, as it happens, could have seen her if he looked out his office window, but he is not in his offices on Chestnut Street. He is being humiliated in a meeting with Senator Arlen Specter, one block north down 15th Street at City Hall. Specter snaps, what is it you want? Her father consults his notes on index cards, doesn't react, tells the motherfucker what he wants, and gets it. Her father has been watching the girl turn feral and done nothing to stop it. She is going to I. Goldberg for Timberland boots with his cash in her pocket. She is free when she has his cash in her pocket. But I have stranded the girl on the unsightly Penn Center stairs, whipsawing between aesthetic and financial rejuvenation of a major downtown, also known as redevelopment, and its failure as an innovative matter of cooperation between reform and capital. 
such that the object is reduced to its absolute essentials and totally deprived of its function. Let us go back to the Laurel Canyon scene of the 1960s that both begins and arrests the girls' movement unto the big world, where an image of Joni Mitchell's blue is affixed to the wall on a record sleeve, Joni hanging there, no one listening. Unborn at the moment the picture was made, the girl's radiant identification with the saturated blue light, countenance and shadow, suggests the presence of that which is sonically feminine prior to its actual emergence. Joni before the microphone becomes a manner of awakening to a form of speech or life not directed to the politics of the black father, possible and possible to imagine only on and as a conjunction of several elemental planes. As the curves of Joni's face resist the light the camera requires and implies and break out in a fury of shadow, in childhood, segregation was not allowed the girl who is essentially unhanded by Jim Crow, the last little plinkety SOS barely on a t-shirt, which results in incidental denial of Joni Mitchell who implies segregation and also somehow allows through the girl distortion of the interpretive tools that would tell us what she would be allowed to become in the built city and her movements through and away from it in the accidental discovery of the fact that art would not necessarily kill her. Without knowing the precise angle of ascent of Penn Center Plaza's stairs, it's hard to say whether Alexander Calder's statue of William Penn would be visible at their crest without considerable craning of the neck. The site of the clothespin is 200 yards, give or take, from the western walls of City Hall, 22 feet thick in some places, anti-modern or faux ancient, as was tacit agreement of the banker class to build no structure higher than 548 feet or the top of Penn's hat for nearly a century. Besides, the girl is diminutive. Looking straight ahead, the girl is eye level with the hot dog cart obstructing her view of Dilworth Plaza, a filthy dim slab covering two square blocks on a good weather day, otherwise recalling the drippy malignant toad now squashed that was the Chinese wall originating at the old Broad Street station. No one ever mentioned that the old station had existed. It had never existed. She read about it in a book. Her father was a toddler when it was demolished in 1953, and no one knows anything about Philadelphia before her father, who did not know his father, who was not in Philadelphia or from it. The girl's attachment to the place is loose, belonging to a separate politico-economic history, that of her paternal grandmother, who lived within the system of authorities that produced AFDC and the Richard Allen Holmes, then died at 41, when the girl was nine months old. Her grandmother's cancers and death, loosely contemporaneous with the death of the old industrial city and the full geographic installation of the deep underclass outside the purview of the aesthetic. That is, the PCPC's self-understanding as world strategists, seeing to it that by the year 2009, no part of Philadelphia is ugly and depressed, demanded the removal of the prospective existence of the 16-year-old black girl waiting for a friend, as usual, at the hexagonal guardrail beneath the clothespin. OK. I had this notion that I was going to show these images. from um, my friend Trisha Donnelly's recent work. I don't know if I have time to, to read this other poem. Um, it's, it's how much time do I have? <laughs> how are we doing? Five minutes, I, that's not enough time. So what I'm going to do is I, I do want to show you these images because what I want to do is just sort of show them as 
a kind of example of the kind of material that one might be drawn to and understand that there actually is a relationship of poetic making that they demand, but that does not yet exist in the appropriate form is not an essay, right? Um, and, you know, how do you find such a thing? Like, what motivates you to think about how to write about visual works? And so I just want to show these kind of quietly and, and show you sort of what I've been thinking about and how I've been thinking about how my own practice of writing about making um, can move forward. stop there. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Simone. There's, for the really compelling readings, for your thoughts in the beginning, which I have so many questions I'd like to ask. Um, but let me just say I, oh, and here's a mic for you. Uh, so I'm, I'm Meredith Malone and the curator here at the Kemper Art Museum and the curator of the exhibition um, that is on view currently titled Adam Pendleton to Divide By, an exhibition that's on view through um, January 15th. Um, it was in part the occasion uh, to invite you. I know you've been, you were have become really a key interlocutor, I'd say, in many ways for Adam um, and his practice. You've, you've engaged and collaborated with him in several different ways. And if you uh, go downstairs to the video gallery, I'll just point out one of Adam's portraits is uh, a portrait of Ruby Sales. And if you listen, you will hear someone's voice pop up in a, <laughs> a few moments in that, in that film. Um, Adam's work is very much deeply invested in abstraction, um, but also language and, and poetry. Um, and so it's really, it's an honor to have you here in this space and to be walking through that exhibition with you. Um, I just want to, so I'm going to ask just two questions. I want to leave enough time for everybody here. We will then open it up to a, a broader Q&A. Um, uh, but first, I wonder if we could start by talking a little bit about um, the last poem that you read, the, the clothespin poem. Um, you know, I'm from, I think I told you this earlier, I'm from Philadelphia, so I think it resonated with me, certainly. Um, you, you really created this evocative kind of unfolding of an experience of that city, both kind of over time, um, but it's also a very personal narrative, it seems. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about, and that was a commissioned piece too, is that right? Or, yeah. Um, well, let's see, Nicole Eisenman actually, um, curated an issue for Hauser and Worth's magazine that was just poetry. And the Poetry Project, which is like my sort of poetry home, was also involved in um, that, that situation. So a, a sort of like mutual gathering of poets was asked to contribute to that, mm -hmm. that issue. Um, I wonder if, if you could say a little bit about the conditions of making that, that poem, mm -hmm. but also the evocation of Joan Vitalik sure. in the title, who is an important thought partner for Adam as well. Yes. Um, and I believe for you. And for me too. Yeah. Joan is <laughs> definitely, I mean, Joan, is, Joan is, a, is a friend. Joan is also, so it's, I'm, I'm now 51 and Joan is 30 years older than I am, but I consider her a friend. But first she was my teacher. So um, she sort of taught me to teach. She was my sort of pedagogical mentor and it was only later that I came to know her um, poetry and also her criticism. Her book, The Poetical Wager, is probably one of the most important books on poetics in, of the 20th, late 20th century. But it was her memoir, which I had revisited for the purpose of teaching, um, that sort of made me think about that poem. And 
made me think not only about the practice of, of appropriation, which is not a general part of my own sort of formal toolbox. I'm not a poet who really takes language from other places as a general rule. Um, but I was thinking about memoir, which is a, a slick, tiny little book of, of memoir, memoir of Jones that, that really just refuses the, the notion of coherent memory. And um, I would thought about, well, how if I were using Jones principles of you know poetical <laughs> writing, would I approach my own personal history? And for me, that needed to include a kind of socio-history in the same way that Joan's memoir is involved with kind of like a reading of the 40s and 50s through her own eyes, you know. Um, so, and for me, that meant, you know, the Philadelphia of the 70s and the 80s, which was the one that constituted my childhood. I wonder if I can ask you a question about commissions mm -hmm. <laughs> since um, I uh, if you I know you talked about it in a little way as you know you met the Met wouldn't actually yeah. publish it um, have you gotten you know pushback for that and do you see that as a space maybe for is a space opened up by these requests for you do you think but the way is it our it is a generative way for you to think oh, about writing and like I love to be asked to do anything. I, I'm very grateful to be asked to do anything because I then mostly what I would be doing is cooking and cleaning my house. Truly. Like that is what I would be doing. So to get the opportunity to, you know, have a reason to turn to my own work is always a good thing. On the other hand, I became very quickly aware when I began to be asked to do these kinds of, of things that it was not actually, you know, so it's your work on some level. This doesn't apply to every request, right? But it is not always your work, but your presence that is being requested. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, whatever that means to folks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the Met and I were probably never a good match, you know, it's fine. But that still allowed me to do something with that poem that is that was not a waste of time by any means. And actually I feel like I was able to arrive at a at a very interesting kind of you know, kind of statement about ekphrasis itself in the poem and also you know, like, please don't ask me to just come here on Juneteenth. I was pretty mad, you know, and and it came out in in the writing, and um, and that was not what I was invited to do. But that's okay because they still had to pay me. So, you know, like it's okay. It's it, but it is a choice, right? This is the poetics of of the work too. Like you get to choose how you engage with the request and what your relationship to the work is going to be. And that is, in our case, you know, in the case of, of artists, it's like, you know, I get to choose. Yeah, which is like, yeah, I feel blessed. Well, and that's something I love about the poem you wrote from the commission from Adam. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not fundamentally about Adam's work, but it's really almost seems a large part of it is a working through of you're thinking about artists or writing or writing about visual art and maybe positioning yourself within that. That's you... right, mm -hmm. yeah. But also thinking about some of Adam's sort of fundamental formal choices yeah. and how um, they might enter into, mm -hmm. you know, the way I've been thinking in general. You know, like, I don't think the request is to become someone else in when you're writing, you know, like I'm not a journalist. I try to explain to people, you know, like I, I, I'm not documenting. That's someone else's role. Yeah. Um, but what I can do is sort of offer my, my own thinking as a kind of conduit for the other person's work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we work together yeah. in a way. And um, because I know Adam, you know, um, I felt like that was probably going to be okay, but I was also prepared for it to not be okay. Mm -hmm. So, 
you also have to be ready for somebody to say no thank you. And before I open it up, I did want to, you had mentioned in the beginning of your talk too, like this interest in you know, performance and, and the sonic. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could say, I know you think deeply about music mm -hmm. as well, in addition to you know, uh, the visual arts. And, mm -hmm. and you've written, you write about music as I well. Do. I mean, do you, is there a differentiation in the way that you approach maybe one or the other? Or is it all sort of a piece for you between how you write about music or how you approach writing about the visual arts? Well, I write mostly about contemporary rap music, for one thing. So um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, that the sort of institutional apparatus of, around those two uh, forms of art making are just so radically different from one another that, um, you know, that it's almost like I'm a different person. <laughs> but when I'm, I literally think of myself as being, I think of, Heidegger's sense of nearness a lot, what it is to be near an object, what it is to be um, close to something so that you can see it and um, experience it. And with music, you don't have a choice but to be near it. It, it is, it is a, a waveform. And so that's the first thing, you know, to think about the fact that it is all around you. You're, you're not regarding it in the same way that you're mm -hmm. reading or um, it, it's, you, you're in some ways powerless over it and in some ways powerless over your responses to it. And what, what you might do as a critic or a thinker about music, especially contemporary rap music, is to kind of like try to understand your responses as, your responses as something other than given, like preordained because I think we're sort of encouraged to think about pop music as only sort of like coming to us to sort of stimulate those aspects of our humanity and body that are like low or something, but I, that cannot be the case. <laughs> it just can't be the case that, that, especially, you know, I wrote a lot about Future and Chief Keef for the, for the project that I had been, I wrote this sort of critical project on that music and how it worked in black studies and. Um, I think of them as really important late 20th century artists, you know, like early 21st century artists, like Chief Keef in particular. He came up in the New York Times article on, on um, like how bad art had been for the last 500 years. Chief Keef was the only pop artist mentioned in that article. I was thought that was interesting. Um, but I don't, yeah, they're very different from each other, but I, but I do... Um, yeah, I don't think anybody wants me to like rehearse to them. We're not taking a test, right? So you're not, what would you, what would be the benefit of my saying something to you that you could actually read from somebody else, you know? And, and so I try, you know, to, to resist the impulse to to explain the thing, that's all. Well, I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience, if there's, yeah, here, I can pass, pass the mic off. Uh, hello, everyone, my name is Heidi. Yeah, uh, I, with my family, moved to, uh, from New York City, moved to Washington only one month. Yeah, um, I always want to start, uh, mm, writing my uh, long novel. But uh, my partner about uh, first uh, English is my second language. <laughs> uh, uh, second, uh, so yeah, I didn't have uh, um, uh, uh, like uh, writing uh, experience uh, in the university. Mm -hmm. So my question about uh, how I can start yeah, writing this long novel, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> how you can start writing about art? Yeah. How you can start writing about art or how you can start writing in general? Um, gosh, I think you just start writing. Like, really, you, you, so I, I think that I didn't think of myself as a writer for a very long time until I was, I, I went to law school as a young person. That's, you know, my primary orientation was toward 
employment. When I was, you know, first out of undergraduate school, I was like, how am I going to support myself? And my father was a lawyer, and um, and I said I will go to law school. And but while I was in law school, what I discovered was that there was something about the way my brain was working that was just resisting everything that was happening. And I started, I had been writing poems a little bit, like notebook scribbling kind of since I was about 19. But I never imagined that those things would ever be seen by anyone other than me. But then I started to understand that like, well, first of all, there was like something called intellectual life. Like you could do that. <laughs> I didn't know that. I really didn't. Like, I had been sort of told that you couldn't do that. And also, I read so much. I, I had always been a reader since I was, like, teeny tiny. And I said, well, what if I imagined that the things that I was writing and the experiences of reading that I was having were, like, a life, life, a way of life? And I knew poets, you know, and um, I started to imagine very slowly that the things that I was writing down were real. And that was it. I was writing things down, and I had to project myself into a reality in which those things mattered. If that makes sense. I have so many <clears throat> uh, questions about, uh, one is when you talked about the Delaware crossing, I, th I thought about Robert Colescott's painting mm. and the work that Lowry Sims did to try to get it on the forefront mm. and how far art has come. So I uh, like the fact that you made me think about that. Uh, and also um, the uh, Richard, uh, the Richard Allen Holmes, where Bill Cosby grew up. He's a big art collector. Yeah. I was curious as to, have you ever did any work with him, with his collection? And no, sir. Um, well, Bill Cosby obviously is, a, is an old school Philadelphian, but um, was way outside of the purview of what I was had access to as a young person. You know, I was just like an ordinary middle class kid in Philadelphia. And Bill Cosby by that time was a huge celebrity and lived though in the Philadelphia suburbs. Yeah. And of course, now Bill Cosby's legacy has, you know, has radically been radically altered by his own, you know, criminal actions. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know what will become of, of that legacy or that collection, to be frank. Thank you. Good evening, friend. Hi, Simone. Hi. This is less of a question and just more of a hello. Welcome to St. Louis. My name is Andrea. I'm the co-curator of the culture hip-hop and contemporary art in the That's 21st hello. century at the St. Louis Art <laughs> Museum. And so I just want to express that not only is Simone a, gosh, she's a quiet giant, if you will, she's also on the advisory team for the culture because we worked with a global advisory group to really help us think through uh, not only the works but how they're positioned. And so, Simone, you played such an important role that was uh, so much fun. We're so grateful, and especially to your contribution in the catalog where she's talking about trap music. Mm -hmm. So she is, you know, um, just a real jewel, a real pleasure to work with, and, and so glad to see you connected to St. Louis on, on so many fronts. So welcome, okay. glad to have you here, and thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your lovely, lovely reading. Um, I'm aware that what I'm about to ask is somewhat contradictory in so much as that much of what you spoke about was a resistance to explanation, mm -hmm. to, to the production of poetry that resists explanation or explication. And I'm wondering for you if that, 
that poetic moment is essentially the making of the art, or if that poetic moment kind of sits, I, I guess I'm kind of asking where that moment of non-explanation sits for you as you're particularly writing. Um, I, I'm gonna try to say back your question first. <laughs> okay, it's okay. Um, I understand you to be asking how the writing proceeds if the idea is not to engage in um, a kind of narrative explanation of an idea, not a critical explanation of something that I have observed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a lot of good examples, for one thing, of like how to think about um, where, how you want to be in writing. Um, Maymay Bersenbruga is one of them. I don't think Maymay's poems explain a thing, right? And yet they are evocative of presences and movements through the world and relations in the world and they have a focal point or goal, like an ethical goal or something like that, right? To involve themselves with a, di with a conversation of some kind. So it's not that we, the, the tension is not between not saying anything and saying something, but between, you know, approaches, I think is maybe how I would put it. Um, Leslie Scalapino is a great example of this. Baraka was my first example of how to proceed in poetry. And um, Black Dada Nihilismus, which, you know, was like maybe one of the first poems that like really blew my mind um, and made me understand that the poems were not really about like knowing stuff <laughs> and explain, telling people that you had made this discovery. Right, it was it was about struggle, and um, and so Baraka became an example of that for me, especially obviously the earlier. I'm talking about like the dead lecturer Baraka or Black Magic Baraka, Baraka as many Barakas. Um, but you know, if I I don't do this by myself, truly, and and it's not just poetry either, so. You know, like as a person who's studying all the time, trying to find ways. I mean, Deleuze and Guattari have become very important to me um, be because they opened up a kind of like zone of, of impossibility that I was finding in black studies. I was really struggling to find a way to like approach time and relation in a different way that wasn't canonical in black studies. And a thousand plateaus did that for me. Um, so it's not just you know, Gail Jones. Like is always, I don't know what Gail Jones is, does. To be honest, I couldn't describe it. I'm really bad at talking about novels. But what I do know about Gail Jones is that whenever I read her characters, I discover something. Um, like to, that has that I've never seen before, that I've never seen articulated about black women's experience. And that is my, like that's kind of where I'm trying to get to. Like I'm like, well what, what, what haven't, you know, like what about the, the life that I'm living is useful to um, expose, you know? Cause I don't think of myself as like, I mean I do write about myself, but in a way, like, not really, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, does that begin to? Do we have any more questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Here. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.